Welcome to the HR Champions Podcast with me, Phil Scott of HR Recruit, where I bring you leaders from the HR community. In our podcast, we'll be discussing their careers to date, their passion for HR, and the challenges they have faced along the way. Today, I'm delighted to introduce Julie Bramsden, HR Manager at Hassale. Hassale, an award-winning architectural practice, winning no less than 26 employer awards, which is absolutely huge. So I'm extremely excited for this episode and to hear from Julie and all about a sale. So, Julie, I'm going to pass it over to you if you'd just like to give the listeners a quick overview and a quick introduction to who you are. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Yeah, it's exciting to be here, and thanks for inviting me. So, as you said, I work with the Sale Architecture Limited. We're a company based in Putney uh, in London, and we have 86 employees. I'm the HR manager. I only joined actually in December 19, so um, just over a year that I've been here, and it's a standalone role. Um, so it's you know looking at the sort of strategy, but as, as well as the operational side, and it, you know it's, it really is that award-winning business that that you um, have seen externally. You know I, I'm delighted to say it is lived out internally, and you know so far enjoying my time with a sale. Fantastic. And um, let's start at the beginning then. And how did you originally get into HR? Well, it was an active choice because when I first graduated, my first degree was German and business studies. I went into working in finance, Deutsche Bank, because I could use German, I could use the business aspects. But going long term in a financial career just wasn't where I saw myself going after a couple of years. I just thought, you know, there's got to be more than crunching numbers. And the people aspects, because I was doing staff expenses, I kind of got a little bit involved with with HR at that point. It just became more appealing. And I I really wanted to work with that element of of the company. And then uh, we, we moved up to Yorkshire. So I actually took that opportunity, left Deutsche Bank and thought I'm going to you know, retrain. So I started looking into HR and did a bit of studying with the CIPD and then secured a role via a financial project initially uh, with Thistle Hotels. And, you know, I was very open about what I wanted. I said, look, you know, I'm doing this finance project for now, but I want to go into, um, uh, you know, people, the people side. And they said, well, you know, do a good job for us. There may be an opportunity so I studied and then sure enough, they did sponsor me into HR and I took up the, my first job with them. Um, so I came back to London and took up an HR role in a hotel. So that was a baptism of fire. <laughs> it was a, it was a, because it's, you know, very, everything comes at you in, in that kind of environment, but, you know, great learning curve. And, and then from there, I went into fashion retail. So I was with Harvey Nichols. You know, where I stayed four years and that was you know a much more sort of stable environment um, I mean it's still quite fast moving retail but was know. that in HR or was that in something different so it was HR again yeah yeah so I was um, HR based in their night switch store but then actually I went over and specialized in learning and development so did a lot of the graduate sort of training programs we were sort of were we were the centralized function and we we developed programs and rolled them out across the company so I was up and down to different stores um, training the managers uh, opening new stores restaurants so it was a really exciting time and and then looking at sort of strategy for IT training that kind of thing so yeah it was good and what what is it you, you, you like particularly about working in HR I think it's it's the variety you know no two days are the same you have your sort of routine things that you, that you do but but there's always a new challenge and and it is a progressive line of work because you know you always have to keep abreast of the developments and um, it's grown so much in the time that I've worked in it and it's interesting you know that I don't think you will ever you know, get to to um, know everything about HR you know because it's always changing evolving it's also very different experiences depend on the business you're working with um, so you know that's in size in the physical things that they deliver whether they're services or products the type of culture um, whether they're a global business a UK only business you know so 
the HR roles I've had. And you know, I'm fortunate to have worked in lots of different companies. And I've just loved the, the, the experience of, of what different work environments, different approaches to business and the HR facet, you know, so it's, it, it's it's never dull you know there's always something to learn and you know as long as you keep stretching yourself you know and have that determination to succeed and and look for the next thing how can I improve things you know you can deliver your day job but it's also about well what what's what's the extra steps we can take how can we improve on you know our learning offer or how can we you know really sort of get people more engaged and yeah I just I just really enjoy it and what's been, would you say, has been the secret to your progression? Determination, you know, having to overcome challenge and remain sort of curious and, and, and push myself, you know, and make it, you know, rise to the challenge, you know, because sometimes you go into a, a company when I'd, I'd, I'd been out of it a while um, and I went back into um, HR and the company I joined at the time, you know, it was going through a major restructure so I was there doing an HR management job in, for a sort of stable head office environment. But at the same time, the whole environment was, was changing, going through this huge evolution. So it was having to do both hats or be, be able to sort of offer a, a local service, but also sort of link into the bigger scheme of the, the business and what they wanted to do, get involved into projects as well on a global scale so I, I kind of was working three jobs in one but you know I, I thought well you know I can do this and it's, it's breaking it down and, and trying to you know to learn quickly um, use people around you to get the knowledge you need and just send a check with your colleagues so you know it's, it's being able to respond and be agile and keep pushing on. Let's bring, bring it on to uh a sale and um, so in my intro I mentioned you'd won 26 employer awards talk me through those awards to start with yeah so so they do have many and I can't claim to have been the catalyst to them winning those because most of them you know preceded my employment here you know it certainly is the reason or one of the reasons you know I chose to come and work at a sale when I was looking for for this next job um, back in 2019 I really then you know with experience behind me just thought you know it, for me to be great in my job I really need to work in an environment where HR is truly valued and and that is you know it's lived out by you know there's those physical awards you know you, you kind of there, there there is a sense well they're doing something right but actually you know coming in um, have even my interview process you know it really kind of shone through to me that this was the kind of business I wanted to work in and I'm glad you know they chose me and I, I got to, to to choose them so the, the, the awards again I think you know they've come about for, for different reasons I mean they they have a great benefits package you know for a medium-sized business it's a really generous offer you know we, we kind of provide things I mean when when we're allowed to freely travel we have city trips and we have great benefits you know parental benefits that for again this size of business you know they're quite expensive to to offer but we we really offer the best to our people we grow our talent here you know it's developing individuals there's a real nurturing um, investment you know by the the founder of of the company John Asale, you know, through his entire time with the company, 26 years, you know, people have been hugely important. And along with our design, our finance, we also do a lot of giving something back to the community and the people bit, you know, those four things are what are at the heart of this business. And, you know, it's by living that out from a day-to-day -day basis, year-to-year -year basis, that you really can win the awards you know that the leadership are invested in the people here we look after them um, we're also a very transparent company you know the communication is great they became an EOT uh, almost uh, two years ago now and again for that to be successful I think you know you really have to have a an environment where employee voice exists already we already were doing the type of things 
it takes to be a true EOT. And for those that don't know what an EOT is, I mean, I, I do, but um, do you want to just explain? So it's an employee-owned trust. So the employees who, who work here, technically, over time, because it, it takes time to sort of transition to, to becoming a full EOT, become sort of stakeholders in, in the company. So if we do well, for instance, um, the profit is then shared out amongst everyone and it's done on an equal basis. There's also, uh, we have trustees. So we have two nominated employees who are our employee and trust trustees. And they um, come in to the board meetings and have access and input into hearing about decisions around where the business is going, uh, how we are doing financially. And they are sort of the conduit between everybody else and, and the leadership team and, and you know, provide um, an ear for, for um, all the staff and make sure that we get feedback for different sort of things that they put forward. And there's a formal mechanism and we have a forum. So there's a, you know, a meeting, but there's also a sort of um, suggestion box and they get responses. So it, you know, it really helps sort of everyone feel a part of the changes. And, you know, again, I mean, over this last year, particularly, it's, it's been really important to have um, the trustees work with us and us, you know, hear what staff wants, you know, in response to certain decisions that have been made. And I, I feel, you know, we've really worked hard to try and respond in a way that is, is satisfying what the majority of people Feel will be the best sort of outcome. So yeah, it's, it's, the current it's time, great. Um, it's, it's possibly an advantage being uh, employee ownership trust led because um, you know when times are hard, having everyone fully together and yeah. fully fighting for the cause is pretty critical. I would yeah, imagine. absolutely. And you really have to work at it. You know, I mean, we've been working hard. I mean, it's almost a year now, but every decision where we're having many meetings discussing it you know as, as a director's group with me being party to that um, and considering all options taking all of the um, inputs from everybody else and and just trying to you know make the best decision and you know being very open about the challenge of even getting to that decision and and sharing you know this is what we're, we're trying to do the best we can and this is what, what we're doing and this is why we're doing it and giving people always just that chance to have have their say and 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 it's and it's changed you know it's adopted to to the situation as it's evolved because it's you know last march were different challenges to the last couple of months and you know i think we've been able to be spontaneous and actually you know, take on board what what is really sort of showing as the important things for for everyone and then um... We've spoke about the importance of, of mental health previously. Um, I mean, what does mental health sort of mean to you and how, how have you supported employees um, through the last uh, few months? Well, I think, I mean, it's it's been huge. Um, I mean, for me, it's always been very important. You know, I think it needs equal attention as, as does our physical health. And it's really integral to people as a whole, you know, and you've got to address it as, as a, um, a mental state, but it's about creating a sort of awareness of the type of things that can, you know, cause, cause problems, if you like. Um, it's about educating people around the different types of mental health conditions, so, you know, anxiety, depression, all of those terms that get banded about, but, but really getting people to talk about them and what, what, what does it look like? Um, and it's really making sure there's a support there available sort of on the internal level, but also sort of having more robust sort of external referrals. So, you know, whether it's, we have them, the Architects Benevolent Society and they offer, you know, a helpline um, that, that, you know, I recommend sometimes. A sale also were involved in setting up the architectural um, mental well-being forum um, so we were sort of one of the pioneers of, of that and it's specific to architects and there's a group who meet outside um, on a quarterly basis and discuss from the professions point of whole 
sort of viewpoint, you know, what, what can we do around mental health and provide sort of events and information, but also just, you know, spreading the word again about the importance of looking after mental health. And, and I think, you know, the pandemic, I mean, it's been the ultimate test because over time you've had everything sort of emotionally, um, you know, I've seen from our people, everything, fear, worry, anxiety, you know, very sort of low mood, you know, just concern and, and having to deal with life events during this very difficult time. So, you know, we've had bereavements, we've had relationship breakdowns, you know, financial worries, and it's, it's being able to address all of those different concerns and really being able to listen to the person who's presenting, you know, whatever it is for them. And, you know, being a being realistic about what you can do to support them. And, and absolutely, you know, I've spent many hours uh, one on one with with individuals and giving them that time just to to talk about what's going on for them. But also recognizing as a professional, you know, I'm not a counselor. And when I feel that person should be seeking further help, it's really being confident to say that, you know, do you think you should talk to Cruz Bereavement or, um, you know, a counseling sort of service or counselor, you know, to, to just go through some of these things and assuring people, you know, it's, it's normal, it's, it's okay to have these feelings and, you know, but, but allowing them just to recognize, you know, or support them to get further help if needed. How do you get to, um, how do you get them to open up? I mean, what sort of um, mechanisms have you got in place, or what sort of forums have you got in place to? Is it sort of through one to ones, or how do you manage to um, make sure that everyone is getting that uh, that time and that support to to open up? We've actively targeted it, mental health during this time, so we we've we've sort of celebrated you know, World Mental Health Day, then we've had some team talk sessions just to build in time to the calendar where we can you know, voluntarily come forward and just have a chat with mixed groups who, because we're not seeing each other on a day-to-day -day basis, we kind of put people together who aren't necessarily working as a project team. So they get to talk to you know, somebody from across the, the company. And we, we started those um, last year and you know, people really responded to that. So we, we had about 30 people out of 86 come forward initially. And as they've kind of been more frequent, you know, it's up to about 50 people attending now. So that shows there was a need for that. And people just want that time to, to just to say how it is for them. And, you know, we're quite open here. I think that trust and inclusivity is important for people to be able to open up. And I think, you know, we can say, you know, like, how are you really? Not not just, oh, fine. It's, it's really getting quickly to get people to, to, to be truthful and, and share if you know, things are tough. It's outwardly sort of messaging, you know, that, you know, I'm here and if you need, need someone to talk to, it's putting out through, we've had newsletters on a weekly basis. So we've done some well-being highlights and people have shared and come forward with their stories of what they're experiencing, you know, whether it's anxiety or difficulty and not sleeping or, and just share, we've just sort of shared health tips in terms of like how you can better look after yourself and you know what 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 we found difficult what we've found helpful you know lots of people kind of put forward their own suggestions and we've shared that out across the company and also sort of the well-being focus through the, the architectural well-being forum and and feeding back all of the kind of outcomes of of that so i'm going to bring it back to you and uh, your career so if I remember rightly, you started in mainstream HR, then you went into L&D for um, a few years and then back into, into you know, main sort of HR. What was the decision behind that, you know, about um, and how did you, you find trying to get back into, into main HR? Well, I'd been out, out um, of HR for a while and I, you're right, you know, L&D had been my last Post and I thought about well coming back into it you know that those jobs specifically aren't as readily available I had to strategically kind of make sure that I got work in this field and I was really interested having not been in it for a while 
just to kind of broaden my thinking again. So I wasn't sure, you know, because well-being is very much sort of there, um, as is equality and diversity. And, you know, I was interested in lots of aspects of, of HR. And so the, the choice came to, to go and do my master's, which was also my CIPD qualification. And I thought, you know, it'd be great just to immerse myself again in the latest sort of thinking. And it, it was an international degree. So I got to, to, you know, look at sort of case studies on a global basis. It was also around sort of employee engagement. It was the strategic leadership aspects. So really understanding, you know, how boards work and decision making, the power within organisations. And again, with experience in HR, I think those things are really important to understand because when you come into a company, for you to be successful and, and make sort of headway, you need that strategic leadership buy-in and you need to have your voice at that level as well you know you need to be able to influence the directors to 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 listen to what you're doing with HR and to really sort of embed you know different different ways of doing things so that you know the the masters was great and it, it really then led me to get a project working with an, another architect and it was looking at women in architecture and and through that, you know, I started connecting with different professionals um, back in, in the HR world. And I, it, that then got me my job, actually, you know, it, it sort of, so I worked with an engineering company through someone I'd met on the master's program. And initially it was a maternity cover. So I thought, fabulous, you know, great to get back in, just really sort of feel how the role is now. And the diversity of it, you know, it's just, it's just brilliant because, you know, I said, I said earlier, you know, I was doing a sort of HR operational job, you know, so it's recruitment, it's employee relations, it was training, um, but then alongside that, you know, this company was restructuring, so there were some sort of severances, you know, redundancy, um, looking at sort of restructuring the, the setup of a business and new new jobs and how how is that going to evolve sort of organizationally. And then also because they were an international company, it was global uh, projects so looking at global mobility and how we could better move our people around the, the globe and also well-being was was another one they were really sort of looking at so it was physical mental and financial well-being and what was going to be the offer and and having to be more structured in a corporate company and think about your offer on a bigger scale and the, the variety of of the hr role is is great and I think in the time that I've been away from it to now what is really interesting and exciting is that HR really has a seat at the table and you know real gravitas and especially even this last year whilst it's been challenging for HR it has been proven you know HR is invaluable in this sort of crisis time and you're dealing with all aspects of the people contract um, you know you just and you know my colleagues here have been hugely um, supportive and also sort of recognised you know the input I've had to have and also you know their acknowledgement of that you know they've really appreciated you know they said that we couldn't do this without you you know and, I, couldn't, um, I couldn't agree more I think <laughs> I, th I think it has um, you know now more than ever HR is really really. Know, come onto the map and, and proved proved it, its value um of course it you know we all knew it, it had beforehand but people have really started to uh like I say appreciate so i'm going to uh, ask you some questions uh about you um yeah. who are three people that have been most influential to you i mean my mom i'd say would be the first person that springs to mind in that you know she she was a career lady um you know successfully ran operations for an electronics company and she's very much so sort of firm and fair and I think you know that's who I am really it also you know in this role I you know you have to sort of tread that line with HR you know I think you know, it used to have a sort of warm fluffy feel to, to HR people thought that was the case but you know we have to be involved with some quite tough business decisions and, you know, it's, it's really about being able to 
challenge those at times. It's it's about sort of doing your homework. It's about you know considering the decisions as a sort of across you know across the company and from the fairness point of view and making sure you're legally compliant. So, so there's lots of things you have to consider. You know, it is tough at times, you know, and you, you have to have a certain sort of resilience to that. And, you know, I've had to sort of relearn that, I think, in the last five years. But it really is important to do the job. And, you know, sometimes it's, yeah, you have to have a bit of no-nonsense kind of attitude. But, <laughs> but you know, she, she and I watched her do that, you know, with, with quite tough, company changes her business eventually closed down and it went out to Malaysia and they produced the work there and she had to go out and you know she had to make a lot of people redundant in the company and then watch the business go over to um, another country and help set that up you know so she you know had a, a challenging career but rewarding as well and I think you know I was kind of knew I wanted to do something with my my career and, and opportunities so Anyone else stick out for you? Well, of late, my kids, you know, I'm a single parent and my children in supporting me getting back into HR, you know, I looked after them when they were small and took different choices to be around for them as, as I was on my own with them. So each stage I've gone through to, to get where I am today, it's been sort of looking after them as my priority thing, uh, but also having the support of them. And as they've got older you know they're 15 and 18 now it's just wonderful to to see them be proud in me in, in terms of saying wow mom you've done that you know you've gone and spoken to all of those people and you know, I had to do a presentation at the master's program to about a thousand people and they came along to that and so they've seen me go through challenge and, and work hard they recognize that um, and sometimes it's that little voice you know just to sort of say oh mum you've been working really hard it's, it's quite nice so and I do it you know I, I, I wanted to be successful and you know to provide for them and financially sort of you know be able to do it and remain in London and so you know it's 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 good. So I'm gonna uh, ask you um, about personal development how do you develop uh, personally, how do you, what personal development do you do? So I'm part of an HR architectural network. So for me, because of this role is standalone, I don't have any other HR colleagues. So it's really important to keep a network. Um, so it's a fabulous um, group of people who, well, in the last sort of year, we've met sort of once a month, really, just to help each other and support one another through this whole time so we share information quite readily we've all sort of partaken in surveys to benchmark you know, the, all the different practices and and just you know it's been you know brilliant to, to have that honesty to have that sort of sounding board um, because you know we've had to make a lot of decisions in a short space of time and just get that sort of center check you know that what we're doing is not drastically different to everybody else or is there something else we could be doing have we thought of everything um and and i just couldn't have done it without really so you know i think it's really important especially if you're on your own doing hr that you have an external network and you know, it might be um a specific one to the type of business you're in or the cipd also you know they run uh, their different branches and i think that's terrific too so i've done that along sort of my career so attending different seminars, webinars, hearing, you know, different perspectives. I do a lot of research online, just reading articles. You know, I'm always sort of thinking, oh, what next? You know, I, I kind of have uh, ambition to, to keep learning. And again, as I said earlier, you know, this, this job is one that really requires you to do it. But if, if you love to learn, you know, it's, it's a brilliant profession to be in because there's always something else sort of emerging or there's some different thinking and just being able to um, keep keep abreast of what's new or you know different way of doing things it's interesting and, and for me I think next I, I probably would like to do something more around sort of psychology the MBTI training or strengths finder is another thing I've been looking into 
um, and, and just you know, keep adding things that are useful in my job so I can use them here you know, with some of our sort of leaders, um, but also sort of stretch myself and, and, and actively learn, learn something new. Okay, I'm going to ask you uh, one last question. If you weren't doing your current career, what career would you choose? I think it would probably be, if, if I was starting over, I would probably be a teacher. So to work with uh, primary school kids. I mean, I did do a little bit for a couple of years as um, when my children were small. And, you know, it's hugely rewarding. It's not too dissimilar to HR and in the sort of skill sets you have to sort of rely on. But, you know, I think just from the satisfaction point of view, you know, seeing those little people develop and um, surprise you with their sort of spontaneity and, you know, odd things that they do. It's, um, yeah, it's just quite, quite lovely, really. Um, and, and if not a teacher, I'd probably do something in fashion. I'd love to create, well, clothing, but, but also the, the sort of display aspects. I love colour and pattern and fabrics. So that creative side that I never really got a chance to uh, sort of try out, you know, not knowing much about those kind of opportunities job-wise, but, you know, sort of from working in it a bit at Harvey Nichols, and I just really enjoy um, the creative side. So, yeah, so one of those, I think. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> well, uh, that pretty much brings us to the end. Um, 40 minutes or so have flown by there, so uh, yeah. a massive thank you to... Uh, to you uh julie and um if anyone wants to reach out to you what's the the best way of doing that and can they yeah they can via um linkedin um they can just message me on there and you know i'm happy to connect um if someone wants you <laughs> no problem it's uh we'll uh we'll end, end it there but um a massive thank you i hope the listeners have uh, enjoyed this episode and uh, stay tuned for further episodes of the HR Champions podcast.